This is a quick demonstration of these stylized shaders. There's a lot to go through, so sit tight. First thing I want to show you is the master material. It's built up of material functions, which makes it really easy for you to unplug things you're not going to be using, or perhaps even make your own master material based on your needs. And the way you would do that is to go into the material folder, material functions, and here we can just drag and drop any functions that you want to use. So if we want a color, and then maybe we want a, let's see, a HSV, and then perhaps a gradient on top of that. We can just plug those into each other and plug it into the base color. And there we have our material. So now I would just want to go through some of the key features of the stylized shader, starting with cell shading. This is a material-based cell shader, which means that it does not take into consideration light information from your scene. It is emulating a light within the material, and that direction is found in the parameter collection under material parameter collection master. And then you go into vector parameters and cell direction. And this is basically the direction of your light emulated light source. So if we were to turn this to unlit, we can see that it is still cell shaded. And we have some options here in the cell shader. We can make it a multiply instead of a lerp. And this means that it will multiply these colors with the main color. If we turn the cell shading multiply instead off, it will instead lerp between or blend between the main color or the previous color and the cell shader colors. So if it's at one, it will only use these colors, but if it's at 0.5, it will blend. So it's somewhere between yellow and blue. And if it's at zero, it will be non-existent. So we can change specular, turn that on or off. We can change all these colors. We can change the amount of cell shading, the uh, the intensity of the specular. Oh, sorry, the amount of specular and the intensity of that specular. Here we have the color mask. The left one is using a UV color mask while the right one is using a texture color mask. So starting with the UV color mask, if we go into the mesh itself and look at the UV channel, we can see that it is distributed into quads here or corners. So anything that is in the top left corner will be masked with one color, top right a different color, and bottom left a different color. So let's see how that looks here. So everything that's in the top left, top right, and bottom left, and then bottom right, but nothing's happening because uh, as we can see here, nothing is actually in the bottom right. We can have noise in the red channel, the top left corner. And if we go down to let's see where we have that noise, we turn that on. We can see that we have some noise here. Might be quite hard to see. Scale that up. On the right side, we have the texture color mask, and this is using a texture as an input for the mask. And if we take a look at that, we can see that here. So it's masking the red, green, and blue channels. So of any given pixel, if it is red, it will be given one color, and if it is blue, it will be given another color, and green, a different color. This is useful for getting multiple different combinations of meshes using material instances instead of um, multiple textures. So we can see that the red channel is being masked here, the green channel, and the blue channel. And the same thing here, we can put um, we can put noise in the red channel. So if we turn that on, and we go down to noise and 
turn that on we can see that we are getting noise here we have the distance color it's really simple it's sampling the distance field and based on that value it will lerp between its main color and a given color so the given color we can decide here and then the lerp we can decide here in the offset the fall off and a bias if we want we can step that mask as well just like this just remember to turn off the distance field oh. the effect distance field lighting on the object that you are using this material on next up we have the gradient and this will make a gradient color based on a axis so first of all we have a invert this will basically invert the gradient we have a world space and what this will do is it will make the gradient based on the world space of the object so here we can see that i'm going up and there's hardly any gradient or down and it's fully gradient um, if we turn that off it is local space so it doesn't matter where it is and of course we can adjust things like bias fall off and offset and of course we can change the gradient color as well here we have noise it's very simple it lerps between two colors based on a noise texture so we can change the two colors here and we can step change the step amount we can change the noise texture i only have one texture included in this pack and we can change the scale of the noise and we can offset the noise rotate it and we can turn off the step for example but then we can also decide if we want to use the uv coordinates of the mesh or we can decide if we want to use world projected coordinates so these will be projected from the z axis so from the top and then we can decide if we want those to be local coordinates or world coordinates so if we're using local it will freeze the texture but if we're using world it will change based on its position so here we have the rvt and this is probably the trickiest one to set up so first things first you want to go into your project settings and make sure that you have virtual texture enable virtual texture support ticked on secondly you want to make sure that you have a runtime virtual texture volume in your scene and you want to put in your runtime virtual texture in that volume so here we have rvt color and secondly you want to make or third of all you want to make sure that you have a mesh or a landscape that is let's see drawing into that virtual texture and that is done here under virtual texture make sure you drag it in there and then you want to make sure that that certain mesh is using a material in this case mi landscape that is drawing into the virtual texture within the shader so if we take a look at that material it looks like this and here we're outputting to the runtime virtual texture the base color and the world height you cannot sample and write to the virtual texture within the same material that is why we need to use two separate materials and lastly you want to make sure that your mesh that the mesh that you're using is sampling from that runtime virtual texture which it is doing here and here we can change things like offset fall off bias we can change the hue but nothing's happening because it's it's just gray so let's take a look at that 
the landscape and we can change the color here. Let's get rid of this so we can see more properly. Um, so if we add, for example, a noise, we can see that it is sampling the underlying material perfectly. But if you go outside of the runtime virtual texture volume, it has nothing to sample, so it will produce errors. So let's go back into the RVT. Um, yeah, so here we can blend with the RVT. And we can change things like luminosity. So if you're using a lot of AO, we can adjust the luminosity or the saturation if you want to play around with that, or even the hue. Here we have slope, and it will create a mask based on the normal of the vertex. So anything that is pointing up will be getting one color. Anything that is pointing down will be uh, getting the previous color. So here we have a slope angle, and this is basically the threshold of what is considered to be steep. And we have a color, and then we have a RVT slope, and what this will do is inherit the, the RVT beneath it and make that the slope. So if you have, for example, a snowy landscape underneath and you want to have the snow on top of the rock, maybe, I just tick that and it will automatically sort things out. We have slope noise, so this will create a noise on the slope. And here we can change things like color, um, the step value, offset, and you can add your own noise texture there. Um, yeah, just like the noise function. Here we have water and it is using distance fields to emulate the waves or the foam. So what you want to do is make sure that you have effect distance field lighting ticked off on the water plane. So in this case, this one, otherwise it will not work properly. And then in the material, you can change things like the water color and the wave color or the foam color. You can change the distance and the further out you go, the more artifacts can occur so be careful of that uh, you can change the distance of the foam you can change the number of waves and the speed at which the waves so now we're getting into the world position offset animations and let's start with the bounce so here we have a bounce height basically changes how much well, how high it will bounce, pretty intuitive. Uh, we have squash and stretch. So let's, let's see what that looks like when we turn that off. Uh, we have speed. Um, we have mask Z. What this will do is it will only make the top part of the mesh be affected by the bounce. And here we have things like mask offset. Uh, Let's see or the bias we can have a fall off and things like that so let's see what happens when we take on squash and stretch so this is basically emulating a squash and stretch kind of movement and the way this is working is that it's lurping between a upward position and a downward position and it's scaling the mesh accordingly so if we change the squash amount can see that it, it looks pretty unrealistic that it squashes that much we can change the stretch amount so when it's in the air it will stretch more but you probably need to give it a little bit more height for that to work and we can change the spaghetti amount and what this does is that it it lingers after based on the spaghetti so you can see that it's more fluidy if that's a word and you need to really fine tune these to your liking. So maybe something like, maybe something like that. And then of course we can change the fall off of the mask. Things like mask offset to get some, to get the looky one.
Here we have the world position offset animation offset. And what this will do, it will it will animate your mesh so that it moves back and forth on a certain axis and a certain amount of units um, at a certain speed. So the offset animation amount is how much it will move and the speed is how fast it will move. And the axis is which axis it will move. So right now it's moving on the Y axis, but if we make it on the, let's see, the Z axis, you can see that it's now moving up and down instead. Here we have the ro animation rotation. This will rotate your mesh a certain amount uh, on an axis. So if we, we can change the axis here. So now we'll rotate on the Z axis, but let's keep it on the red axis for demonstration purposes. We can change the pivot offset here. So if we put this to zero, which is in the center of the mesh, it will now rotate around itself. But we can offset this any direction we want to emulate certain types of movements. Uh, we have the rotation amount, that's how much it's rotating. We have the speed, which is basically the same thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have the speed, which is how fast it's rotating, obviously. And then we have, let's see, what else do we have? We have a offset. So let me just turn the rotation amount down. And the, what the cos offset will do is it will offset it so it's either more to the right or more to the left. So if we put this to negative one, we can see that it's, it's only going between uh, negative one and zero. We have a constant rotation, so let me get out of this cinema camera. We can see that it's now rotating around its pivot point constantly. Um, <clears throat> let's change the speed. And here, the rotation amount and rotation speed are the same things when it is set to constant rotation. So keep that in mind. And let's turn that off. And let's turn the and let's reset the pivot point. So here I want to show you the rotation Z gradient. And what this will do, it will, it will only rotate part of the mesh based on a mask. So let's see if we can demonstrate that. So here we can see only the the top part of the mesh is rotating. Maybe I can make that more clear by increasing the rotation amount. Yeah, excellent. So we go negative here. Yeah, there. <laughs> Something like that. This might not be the ideal object to do it on, but if you want your character maybe, or I don't know, chest to wiggle back and forth, you can do that here pretty easily. And it looks, it looks pretty decent. So the, the normals will obviously change when you alter the rotation of a mesh. Um, and it is, those normals will be taken into account on things like uh, cell shading and well anything that uses the normals so here we have the world position offset animation scale and this will basically scale your mesh um, on a certain axis a amount at a speed so we can see here if we change the changes the animation amount to 10 it's not scaling a lot and we can change the speed to five that's kind of pulsating 
and the axis determines which axis it scales on. So now it's scaling on all three axes. But if we only want to scale on, say, the Z axis up and down, we can do that there. And scale animation from center, if we tick that on, it will attempt to get the center point of the mesh and scale it from that. Here we have the world position offset animation walking. And this is actually a combination of world position offsets for this character. But let's focus on the walking. We can change the speed at which it's walking, or maybe running in this case. Um, we can change how far the how far the step length is or the stride. So if we change that to really high, you can see that it's taking really long steps. And the step height is how high his foot will release from the ground. So let's make that maybe well, let's see what happens if we turn that off. And let's go really high. Looks like he has flippers on. Um, we can change the spaghetti amount, so this is how much the mesh lingers behind based on the mask. So we turn that off, it's very rigid. If we turn that up real high, we can see that's very spaghetti. But we can even go negative here, so if we go to negative 7, we can see that it produces a different type of movement. Let's keep that at 5, and let's maybe lower this a little. So it's all based on the mask offset, or it's all based, the walk is very heavily based on the mask, and here we can change the the mask offset, the mask fall off, and the mask bias, like everything else. So you're gonna need to, you're gonna need to fine tune this uh, to find something that fits, fits your mesh. The mesh itself needs to be vertex painted in a particular way. So let's see if we can go into the mesh paint. And here we can see the setup. So the left foot and the right arm is using green. So paint those green and then the right foot and the left arm is going to be using red. That is how the shader knows which which limb is which. And this, of course, scales infinitely with however many legs you want. So here we can see a eight-legged creature. And if you want a thousand legs, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you paint them every other. Uh, actually, let's let's look how this. Let's see how this is painted. Uh, here we can see every other leg is red and every other leg is green so same thing here we can change the speed the spaghetti amount and so on and make sure you fine-tune the mask so that you find something that looks right for your character Here we have the rope position offset animation winding, and we have a few parameters here. We can change things like speed, frequency. Oh, that's maybe a little too low. And the intensity. Uh, if you are using instances that um, are going to be using this animation, let's see what happens if we spit out a few instances. It won't look good because the instanceStatic Mesh component transform is using uh, its own local space. So if you tick in the box winding is instance, it will fix the the calculation. Here we have world position offset blob, and what this will do is it will blob your meshes based on the distance fields. So we can change the intensity, the offset. Let's get that really high so you can see. 
and the fall off and of course the bias as well and to make sure this is working you have to turn off effect distance field lighting on the mesh that you wish to blob here we have foliage wobble and what this will do is it will wobble your mesh based on a input from a blueprint so here we have a regular sphere that's sphere tracing over these instances and sending in information via custom data so in the foliage wobble material we can change things like let's see here how much they bend so you can see if they're very stiff maybe you want them to not bend so much you can change how much they will wobble once they are struck that might be a little too much you can change how fast the wobble ends so if we put the decay really high oh maybe a little higher we can change things like the wobble mask fall off and this will affect how much of the mesh will be affected by the wobble so if we put that really low we can see that almost the entire mesh is now affected but if we put it up really high we can see that now almost none of the mesh is being affected so you need to find some kind of balance there for your for your needs there is a wobble use vertex color and that is if you have a mesh that already has a vertex color gradient in the red channel going from top to bottom you can just take that in and it will not use the uh, the calculated mask within the shader we also have a use relative impact force so depending on the speed at which your character or projectile or whatever it is is hitting these um, grass grass balls uh, it will scale the wobble amount and the bend amount here we have the first post processing material and this is the cell shader so first things first make sure your scene is set up appropriately so if we turn off the post processing here we can see that how it looks without the cell shader on and what it is doing is taking into it's making a mask based on the shadows and the midtones of this image right here so if we turn off the skylight you can see that's very harsh and the harsher the better so let's just get rid of that skylight altogether and let's make the directional light slightly stronger perhaps that's really good the more contrast the easier it will be for the cell shader to detect what is what so let's turn that back on and we can see here that is working perfectly and in the post-processing material we have a few options but let's start with the cell shadow amount and this is how much cell shading you want so if we adjust this we can see that we're adjusting the amount of shadow so we have the blend option right here and what this will do is it will blend with whatever is behind this post-processing material in this case it will be this we have a cell midtone and this is basically the color or tint of the midtone of the cell shader and then we have the shadow and this is the color of the shadow and then we have the intensity of the shadow we have the color of the specular highlight and we have the specular amount and we have the intensity of the specular and then we have the multiply instead of lerp and what this will do was is that it will multiply with whatever's behind this post processing effect instead of blending it so now it's going to multiply these colors with this right here 
And then we also have a bool to totally tick off the specular altogether. Here's a quick example of implementing emissive materials in a post-processing cell shader. So if this is your scene right here, and then you slap on the post-processing cell shader, it will look like this. And there is no shadow information to be gathered from the emissive material. So in order to enable emissive materials within the cell shader post-processing, all we do is we render a custom depth pass on the emissive object. And what this will do is, is that it will basically mask out the that object so it is not included within the cell shader, the post-processing cell shader. Here we have the post-processing etching effect. And what this is doing is that it's creating a mask based on the shadows and midtones but also the ambient occlusion, and then it's distributing a world projected uh, texture on that mask, or based on that mask. So we have a few different options here we can play with, and the first one is color, and that is the main color of the etching itself. Let's make that a dark brown, maybe. We have the only etching color, we'll get back to that real quickly. Um, we have the AO influence, and this is how much of the mask is going to be influenced by the ambient occlusion or rather, or the uh, midtones and highlights. So if we make this only ambient occlusion, which it will be zero, you can see that a lot is being etched, and that might not be so good. So we have an offset here, which is offsetting the ambient occlusion and what is considered ambient occlusion. So if we bring that up, we can fine-tune that mask a little bit. Uh, we have the bias of the mask here, which means that the darker areas will become darker and the lighter areas will become lighter. So it's also another fine tuning tool. And then we have all the textures which are being used for the etching. And here you can pop in whatever you want. And then we have the tile. So this is the, the size of those textures. And then we have the depth fade length. And what this is doing is that it's fading out the hatching effect the further away from the camera you are. So now it's set to 8,000. I think this is about 8,000 units from the camera. It will start fading out. So we can see here in the background that there is a slight etching effect and that does not look so good. So let's bring it, bring the depth fade length down to about 3,000. So now only things that are 3,000 units in front of the camera will be rendered with the hatch effect, or the etching effect, sorry. And we also have a depth bias, and this is the bias of the depth fade mask. Only etching will display only the etching. Otherwise, it will be layered on top or blended on top of the underlying image. So in this case, it's the mesh itself. We have only etching texture, and this is if you want to pop in something like a paper texture um, in the UV viewport space, it will do that. But I don't have any paper texture here. And then we have blend, and this is blending with whatever's underneath. Here we have the post-processing outline, and here we have a few parameters we can play with. We have the line thickness. And then we have the line multiplier and the line bias. So what the multiplier and bias do is it's telling the shader what is considered a line and what is not considered a line. So you will have to tweak these till you get something that you like. And then of course we have the line color, which is the line color. And then we have emission, and that's if you want the line to glow or not. And then we have blend, and what this will do is that it will blend with whatever is underneath the post-processing. So here we have only outlines ticked, so they will only show the outlines and a white background. But if we tick that off, we can see that it's blending with the underlying image. And so if we put the blend to something like 0.5, we can see that the outlines are now 50% blending with the background. 
And then we have fade length and fade bias, and this is the same thing as before. It will fade out this post-processing effect the further away that pixel is from the camera. And then we have the post-processing distortion, and what this is doing is that it's distorting the viewport UVs, and this can be combined with the outline to get a little hand-drawn squiggly look going. So we have a distortion parameter, and that is how much distortion we want. And we have a scale, and that is basically the frequency of the distortion. And you can, of course, use this without any outlines and just with a background. And you can get some really interesting effects. And if you want to have a custom texture as the distortion texture, just go into the material and add it there. You can of course combine all of these post-processing effects however you like. So here is a demonstration of the cell shader with the outlines and the distortion. So let's play around with that. If we bring down the distortion a little bit, down the frequency, and maybe make those lines a little thicker. And then we can play around with the midtones and shadows. You can start to get some really interesting effects going on here. We can even multiply it. And that's looking pretty good. Thank you so much for watching and take care. And if you have any questions, just send me an email.